I have observed, as many others have uh, many times, that, that despite anyone's gender identity, quote unquote, the fact is that when they die, and I said this on Dr. Phil, I said it was one, uh, you know, when you die and are buried in the ground and your flesh rots away, leaving only your bones, all that will be left, almost all, is your sex, no matter how you identify it. When archaeologists and anthropologists of the future exhume your grave and look at your remains, they will declare you male or female. Your self-identity will be gone, but your sex will remain. This is how deeply embedded it is. It is the last thing about you that anyone will be able to know. Just as it's one of the first things about you that anyone will be able to know. Well, all of that remains true. I mean, none of that has ever changed, has changed or ever will. The only adjustment that uh, we have to make now is in the assumption that archaeologists and anthropologists of the future will actually be free and willing to make these kinds of statements about people of the past. A report in the College Fix suggests otherwise. It says, quote, as soon as ancient human remains are excavated, archaeologists begin the work of determining a number of traits about the individual, including age, race, and gender. But a new school of thought within archaeology is pushing scientists to think twice about assigning gender to ancient human remains. It is possible to determine whether a skeleton is from a biological male or female using objective observations based on the size and shape of the bones. Criminal forensic detectives, for example, do it frequently in their line of work. But Gender activists argue scientists cannot know how an ancient individual identified themselves. Quote, uh, you might know the argument that the archaeologists who find your bones one day will assign you the same gender as you had at birth. So regardless of whether you transition, you can't escape your assigned sex, tweeted Canadian master's degree candidate Emma Palladino last week. Palladino, who's seeking an advanced degree in archaeology, called assigning gender to an ancient human bull****. Quote, Labeling remains male or female is rarely the end goal of any excavation anyway, wrote Paladino. The bioarchaeology of the individual is what we aim for, factoring in absolutely everything we discover about a person into a nuanced and open-ended biography of their life. Now, it's not just one whack job saying this. Uh, it's many whack jobs. There's a whole movement in the field now to conform the work of anthropology with the demands of trans activists. The fix continues. Quote, gender activists have formed a group called the Trans Doe Task Force to explore ways in which current standards in forensic human identification do a disservice to people who do not clearly fit the gender binary. We propose a gender expansive approach to human identification by combing missing and unidentified databases looking for contextual clues such as um, descendants wearing uh, clothing culturally coded to a a decedents, rather, wearing clothing culturally coded to a gender other than their assigned sex, the group's mission statement reads. Well, we maintain our own database of missing and un unidentified people who we've determined may be transgender or gender variant, as most current database systems do not permit comparison of missing to unidentified across different binary sex categories, the group writes. Uh, which, which, by the way, means that uh, we're talking about the forensic element of this, uh, forensic detectives, people working cold cases and everything. If they really apply this, it makes their work impossible. It's, you can't do it anymore. Because usually you uh, find the remains of someone and then you try to match them with a database, figure out who it is, you know, who are these remains, and then you can figure out how they died. Well, in order to match them, you, you first, one of the things you have to know is, okay, well, the, the age, race, and sex. And then you take that, and then you go to the database of missing people, and you say, okay, well, this matches that person. But if they're looking at the remains and saying, well, we don't know their sex, we have no idea, we can't possibly know, this is just a person, then there's no way to narrow it down and ever match that person with a missing person, which means that the whole field of cold cases, forensic work, all of that is just out the window including the entire field of anthropology and archaeology. All of it is done, out there, along with the dictionary and reality itself. A little more here from The Fix. It says, this February, University of Kansas Associate Professor Jennifer Raff published Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, in which she argued that there are no neat divisions between physically or genetically male or female individuals. Raff suggested, suggested scientists cannot know the gender of a 9,000-year-old biologically Peruvian hunter because they don't know whether the hunter identified as male or female. A duality concept, she says, was, quote, imposed by Christian colonizers. Well, she's right, in a way. 
Um, nobody can know the gender of a 9,000-year-old Peruvian hunter because nobody 9,000 years ago or 900 years ago or 90 years ago had a gender. The concept hadn't been invented yet and imposed on the world by woke leftist pervert colonizers. And that's the only kind of colonizing that really happens anymore, in the West anyway. Everyone back in those days had only a sex and that was it. They may have had different words and different languages to communicate it, obviously, but there were people who got pregnant and people who did the impregnating. And those were the two categories. The only two firm categories any society has ever had until ours. These activists disguised as scientists recognize this reality and they see the problem it creates for them because this is one of the things, one of the questions they, they found it so difficult to answer. I mean, they find every question difficult to answer, but especially this one, which is why should anyone listen to your rambling nonsense that you just came up with a few years ago? Like, why should we care? You came up with this stuff a few years ago. Why should I care about that? Why should anyone care about it? Why should we allow you to redefine concepts that have endured for millennia? For millennia, billions of people have lived and, di lived and died and had no problem with these categories. Have not caused any problems for them. It's been, it has not caused any confusion. And then you come along and you, you wanna change all of this? And not only change it for yourselves, but, but insist that everyone else has to look at it differently? Well, they can't explain why we should do that. So. They seek to rewrite history and superimpose their ideological fixations onto the past, even the very ancient past. I mean, the level of narcissism on display here is monumental, psychotic, unfathomable. They now wish to perform a sort of posthumous baptism on the entire human race, christening everyone, all of our ancestors, in the waters of gender theory. Rewriting the history and lives and legacies of all of our ancestors in order to justify their modern day sexual fixations and fetishes. I mean, it was bad enough when they condemned all of our ancestors as bigots and racists and transphobes, refusing to give them the grace of historical context. That was bad enough. What they seek to do now is so much worse. Rather than condemn the ghosts of our great great grandparents, They'll instead recruit them, enlist them to the LGBT cause against their will. A sort of posthumous conscription, a uh, selective service of the dead, if you will. They seek not only to build their own reality in their own universe, but to extend their reach across space, as well as time, into the past, and then on to the present, and out towards the future. And they can do all of this or at least attempt it. But the truth remains, no matter what. And it falls to us to defend it against all threats.